Hello and welcome to this exploring session. It's a return visit. Uh, this is a uh, second look exploring session as we look at the old wives tale once again. We've already looked at this as an exploring session. We stopped and started and discussed it as we went along. This time what we're going to do is try and get the overall shape of the play uh, in a much more performative -y way. That doesn't mean everyone in the room is necessarily going to be giving uh, uh, full-on performances, but the invitation is now more out there for people to muck about a bit more. It's, it's Friday for us. It's the end of the week. We're going to have a, a, a be a bit more silly with it than we normally have been in the past. He said, looking around the room like we've not been very, very silly quite a lot <laughs> in the past. Um, this is The Old Wives' Tale by George Peel. Um, it is a pleasant, conceited comedy played by the Queen's Majesty's players. It is not a long play uh, run through. Uh, we should, it'll be something over an hour, I'd have thought, but not probably all that much more. So we will have time to discuss our thoughts at the end, thinking about uh, uh, the way the doubling worked for people, uh, individual characters, thoughts and things. Uh, things may go horribly wrong. Uh, there are no scenes per se. The, the, the scenes sort of flow into each other. Um, and we won't be reading stage directions. The only stage directions from the text we have kept in are the ones that explain really quite fiddly complicated stuff. And we have sort of semi-transposed them into dialogue for uh, Madge. So for readers at home, anytime Madge says something along the lines of, look! or, oh, I can see, or anything like that, that means the dialogue that follows has been just interpolated and thrown in to just explain what the hell's going on, because uh, so, there's only so much we can do physically. Some of it may work naturally, and some of it may not. Uh, hopefully it will, and it will all be good fun and informative on some level as to how this play functions. So who is reading today? So performing. Uh, many people are doubled, some people are not. Uh, so from the outside of the story, reading Madge today is... Hello, my name is Lynn Freitas. I'm a teacher. I live in the United States. Also from outside the story, uh, reading Frolic today is... Hello, my name is Francis Cox. I'm an actor living in Amsterdam. And uh, reading Fantastic today is... Hi, I'm Eric, and need I say more? <laughs> obviously, obviously not. Um, reading today, Sacrapant, a church warden, and playing uh, a fiddler is... Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer, and director, and I run a little audio company called Sounds Curious. Uh, today, reading Antic, Eumenides, a friar, and also one of the Furies. There are a lot of Furies that are going to appear today. Heaven help us all. Reading those today is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, and this is my friend, the Fury. <laughs> um, we're going to go for a very, very broad church of what a Fury should look like in this. Uh, ah. Reading today, Clunch, uh, Arrestus, uh, Jack, uh, Sexton, and also a Fury, a fury is... Uh... Muted at the moment, Liza. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Liza. I'm an actor, singer, and uh, text coach to actors in London. Uh, reading Vanalia, Zantipa, hostess, and also playing a woman, uh, is. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Missy. I'm an author uh, there are various parts in this uh, play who are basically on stage, but uh, but uh, uh, are, are there uh, uh, on mass as people. So we have various uh, uh, people uh, playing uh, similarly. Sasha is reading Adelia Celenta and also a woman. Indeed, I am. My name's Sasha Cooper, and I'm a professional performer, actress, writer, director, and a general crazy, crazy creative based in Brighton in the UK. <laughs> Uh, reading uh, Brother Number One, uh, Huenabengo and Wigan is... Hi, I'm Steve Longstaff, scholar of early modern drama based in newly locked down Lancaster in the UK. And uh, reading uh, Brother Number Two, Lambriscus, Corribus and Booby today is... Hello, I'm Dan, I'm an actor based in Montpellier, France. Uh, and I think that's everyone. Have I missed anybody out? I don't think I have, uh, but maybe I have. Uh, no, no, I haven't. Okay, and I am your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading The uh, the Harvest Men, uh, uh, Various Voices, and uh, The Big Giant Head. I will also throw in occasional <laughs> random uh, sound effects, uh, but probably not too many. Uh, so... 
are uh, just giving them uh, all the performers a moment to just to just center themselves, get themselves ready uh, for this story within a story. Uh, as we are transported now into the woods, <clears throat> these terrifying woods. <laughs> and as we see the appearance of our first characters wandering. How oh, now, fellow frolic? What? All a mort? Does this sadness become my madness? What? Though we have lost our way in the woods, yet never hang the head as though there has no hope to live till tomorrow. For fantastic and I will warrant thy life tonight at twenty in the hundred. Antic and fantastic, as I am frolic Franyan, never in all my life was I so dead slain. What? To lose our way in the wood without either fire or candle, so uncomfortable. O oh, Coulomb, O oh, Terra, O oh, Maria, O oh, Neptune! What resteth then, uh, sorry, uh, why thou makes it so strange, seeing Cupid hath led our young master to the fair lady, and she is the only saint that he hath sworn to serve? What resteth then, but we commit him to his wench, and each of us take his stand up in a tree and sing out our ill fortune to the tune of O oh, Man in Desperation? Desperately spoken, fellow frolic, in the dark. But seeing it falls out thus, let us rehearse the old proverb. Three merry men, and three merry men, and three merry men be we. <laughs> I in the wood, and thou on the ground, and Jack sleeps in the tree. A dog in the wood, or a wooden dog. Oh, comfortable hearing. I had even in his life, the, the chamberlain of the white horse had called me up to bed. Either hath this trotting cur gone out of his circuit, or else we are near some village, which should not be far off, for I perceive the glimmering of a glowworm, a candle, or a cat's eye, my life for a halfpenny. In the name of my own father, be thou ox or ass that appearest, tell us what, what thou art. What am I? Well, I am Clunch the Smith, what are you? What make you in my territories at this time of the night? What do we make, dost thou ask? Why we make faces for fear, such as if thy mortal eyes could behold, would make thee water the long seams of thy side slops, Smith. And in faith, sir, unless your hospitality do relieve us, we are like to wander with a sorrowful hey-ho among the owlets and hobgoblins of the forest, Good Vulcan, for Cupid's sake that hath cozened us all, befriend us as thou mayest, and command us howsoever, wheresoever, whensoever, in whatsoever, forever and ever. Well, masters, it seems to me you have lost your way in the wood. In consideration whereof, if you will go with Clunch to his cottage, you shall have house room and a good fire to sit by, although we have no bedding to put you in. Oh, oh blessed Smith, Smith. Oh, bountiful, oh, bountiful Clunch. clunch. For your further entertainment, it shall be as it may be, so and so. Oh, hark! This is Ball, my dog, that bids you all welcome in his own language. Good boy, good boy, good boy. Come, take heed for stumbling on the threshold. Open door, Madge! Take in guests! Welcome, Clunch, and good fellows all that come with my good men. For my good man's sake, come on, sit down. Here is a piece of cheese and a pudding of my own making. Thanks, Gamma. A good example for the wives of our town. Gamma, though th thou and thy good man sit, sit lovingly together, we come to chat and not to eat. Well, masters, if, you eat, if you'll eat nothing, take away. Uh, come, what shall we do to pass the time? Lay a crab in the fire to roast for lamb's wool? Uh, what shall we have a game at Trump or Ruff to drive away the time? How say you? A smith leads a life as merry as a king with Madge's wife. Sarah Frolic, I, I am sure thou art not without some round or other. No doubt but Clunch can bear his part. Else think you me ill brought up. So set to it when you will. And as the rye reached to the chin, a uh, chop cherry, chop cherry, chop cherry, cherry ride right within, within. A strawberry swimming in the cream, the cream and boys playing in the stream. Oh. 
They know, they know, they know my true love said. My true love said. Till that time come again. Till that time come again. She could not live with a maid. This sport does well, but methinks Gamma, a merry winter's tale, would drive away the time trimly come. I'm sure you're not without a score. If faith, Gamma, a tale of an hour long were as good as an hour of sleep. Look you, Gamma, of the giant and the king's daughter, and I know not what. I have seen the day when I was a little one. You might have drawn me a mile after you with such a discourse. Well, since you are so importunate, my good man shall fill the pot and get him to bed. They that ply their work must keep good hours. One of you go lie with him. He's a clean-skinned man, I tell you, without either spavin or wind gall. So... I am content to drive away the time with an old wives' winter's tale. No better hay in Devonshire, oh my word, Gammer. I'll be one of your audience. And I another, that's flat. Then must I to bed with the good man? On a knock, Gammer. Good night, Frolic. Come on, my lad. Thou shalt take thy unnatural rest with me. Yet this vantage shall we have of them in the morning to be ready at the sight thereof extempore. Now, this bargain, my masters, must I make with you, that you will say hum and ha to my tale, so that I know you are awake. Content, Gammer, that we will do. Once upon a time there was a king, or lord, or duke, that had a fair daughter, the fairest that ever was, as white as snow and as red as blood. And once upon a time his daughter was stolen away. And he sent all his men to seek out his daughter, and he sent so long that he sent all his men out of the land. Who dressed his dinner then? Nay, either hear my tale or kiss my tail. Well said, well said. One weird tale, Gammer. Oh, oh, Lord, I quite forgot. There was a conjurer, and this conjurer could do anything, and he turned himself into a great dragon and carried the king's daughter away in his mouth to a castle that he had made of stone. And there he kept her, I know not how long, till at last all the king's men went out so long that her two brothers went to seek her. Oh, I forgot, she, he, I would say, turned a proper young man into a bear at night and a man in a day, and keeps by a cross that parts three several ways, and he made his lady run mad. God knows, who comes here? Stop, Gamma. Here, here's some calm to tell your tale for you. Let them alone. Let us hear what they will say. Upon these chalky cliffs of Albion we are arrived now with tedious toil, encompassing the wild world around about, to seek our sister, seek fair Delia forth. Yet cannot we so much as hear of her. Oh, fortune, cruel. Cruel and unkind. Unkind in that we cannot find our sister. Our sister, hapless in her cruel chance. Soft, where have we here? Now, Father, God be your speed. What do you gather there? Hips and whores, sticks and straws, and things that I gather on the ground, my son. Hips and whores and sticks and straws? Why, is that all your food, Father? Yes, son. Father. Here's an orm's penny for me, and if I speed in that I go for, I will give thee as good a gown of grey as ever thou dot didst wear. Uh, and father, here's another orm's penny for me, and if I speed in my journey, I will give thee a palmer's staff of ivory and a scallop shell of beaten gold. Was she fair? Aye, the fairest for white and the purest for red as the blood of the deer or the driven snow. Then hark well and mark well my old spell. Be not afraid of every stranger. Start not aside at every danger. Things that seem are not the same. Blow a blast at every flame. For when one flame of fire goes out, then come your wishes well about. If any ask who told you this good, say, the white bear of England's wood. Brother, heard you not what the old man said? Be not afraid of every stranger. Start not aside for every danger. Things that seem 
are not the same and blow a blast at every flame. If any ask who told you this good, say the white brother of Bruton's wood. Well, if this do us any good, welfare the white bear of England's wood. Now sit thee here and tell a heavy tale, sad in thy mood and sober in thy cheer. Here sit thee now and to thyself relate the hard mishap of thy most wretched state. In Thessaly I lived in sweet content, until that fortune wrought my overthrow. For there I wedded was unto a dame that lived in honour, virtue, love, and fame. But sacrapent that cursed sorcerer, being besotted with my beauteous love, my dearest love, my true betrothed wife, did seek the means to rid me of my life. But worse than this, he with his chanting spells did turn me straight into an ugly bear. And uh, when the sun doth settle in the west, then I begin to don my ugly hide. And all the day I sit, as now you see, and speak in riddles, <clears throat> all inspired with rage, seeming an old and miserable man, and yet I have been April of mine age. See, where Venelia, my betrothed love, runs madding, all enraged throughout the woods, all by his cursed and enchanting spells. Oh, no. Oh, but here comes Lampriscus, my discontented neighbor. How now, neighbor? You look toward the ground as well as I. You muse on something. Neighbor, on nothing but on the matter I so often moved to you. If you do anything for charity, help me. If you do anything for neighborhood or brotherhood, help me. Never was one so cumbered as is poor Lampriscus. And to begin, I pray, receive this pot of honey to mend your fare. Thanks, neighbor, set it down. Ooh, honey is always welcome to the bear. Uh, well, and now, neighbor, let me hear the cause of your coming. I am, as you know, neighbor, a man unmarried and lived so unquietly with my two wives that I keep every year holy the day wherein I buried them both. The first was on St. Andrew's Day, the other on St. Luke's. And now, neighbor, you of this country say your custom is out. But on with your tale, neighbor. By my first wife, whose tongue wearied me alive and sounded in my ears like the clapper of a great bell, whose talk was a, a continual torment to all that dwelt by her or lived nigh her. You have heard me say I had a handsome daughter. A true neighbor. She it is that afflicts me with her continual clamors and hangs on me like a burr. Poor she is, and proud she is, as poor as a sheep new shorn, and as proud of her hopes as a peacock of her tail well grown. Well said, Lampriscus. You speak it like an Englishman. As cursed as a wasp, and as froward as a child new taken from the mother's teeth. She is to my age as smoke to the eyes, or as vinegar to the teeth. Holily praised neighbor. As much for the next. By my other wife, I had a daughter, so hard favored, so foul and ill faced, that I think a grove full of golden trees and the leaves of rubies and diamonds would not be a dowry answerable to her deformity. Ooh. Uh, well, neighbor, now you have spoke, hear me speak. Uh, send them to the well for the water of life. There shall they find their fortunes unlooked for. Neighbor, farewell. Farewell, and a thousand. Go with poor Lampriscus to put in execution this excellent counsel. Why, this goes round without a fiddling stick. But do you hear, Gamma, 
Was this the man that was a bear in the night and a man in the day? Aye, this is he, and the man that came with him was a beggar and dwelt upon a green. But soft, who comes here? Oh, these are the harvestmen. Ten to one, they sing a song of mowing. O oh, ye that lovely love is be, pray you for me. Lo, here we come a sowing a sowing, and how sweet fruits of love in your sweet hearts well may it prove. O oh, ye that lovely love is be, pray ye you for me. All together, lo, we have come a sowing a sowing, and so sweet fruits of love in your sweet hearts well may it prove. What is he? Oh, this is one that is going to the conjurer. Let him alone. Hear what he says. No, by Mars and Mercury, Jupiter and Janus, Sol and Saturnus, Venus and Vesta, Pallas and Proserpina, and by the honor of my house, Polymacroplacidus. It is a wonder to see what this love will make, silly fellows, adventure, even in the wane of their wits and infancy of their discretion. Alas, my friend, what fortune calls thee forth to seek thy fortune among brazen gates, enchanted towers, fire and brimstone, thunder and lightning? Beauty, I tell thee, is peerless, and she precious whom thou affectest. Do off these desires, good countrymen, good friend, run away from thyself, and so soon as thou canst forget her, whom none must inherit but he that can monsters tame, labours achieve, riddles absolve. Loose enchantments, murder, magic, and kill conjuring. And that is the great and mighty Guanabango. Hark you, sir, hark you. First, no, I have here the flirting feather and have given the parish the start for the long stock. Now, sir, if it be no more but running through a little lightning and thunder and riddle me, riddle me, what's this? I'll have the wench from a conjurer if he were ten conjurers. I have abandoned the court and honourable company to do my devoir against this sore sorcerer and mighty magician. If this lady be so fair as she is said to be, she is mine. She is mine. Meus. Mea. Meum in contemptum omnium grammaticor. Oh, falsum latinum, the fair maid is minimum cum appertinetibus gegiblites and all. If she be mine, as I assure myself the heavens will do somewhat to reward my worthiness, she shall be allied to none of the meanest gods but be invested in the most famous stock of Wernabango. Polymacroplacidus, my grandfather, my father, Bergopolenio, my mother, Dianora di Sardinia, famously descended. Do you hear, sir? Had you not a cousin that was called Gustus Ceridus? <laughs> Indeed, I had a cousin that sometimes followed the court, unfortunately, and his name, Busti Gusti Ceridus. Ah, Lord, I know him well. He is the knight of the neat's feet. Oh, he loved no cape on better. He often finds deceived his boy of his dinner. That was his fault. Good Busti Gusti Ceridus. Come, shall we go along? Soft. Here is an old man at the cross. Let us ask him the way hither. Ho, Yugatha, I pray you, tell where the wise man, the conjurer, dwells. <clears throat> where that earthly goddess keepeth her abode, the commander of my thoughts and fair mistress of my heart. Fair enough and far enough from your fingering, son. 
I will follow my own fortune after mine own fancy and do accord to mine own discretion. Yet, give an old man something before you go. Ah, father, methinks a, a piece of this cake might serve your turn. Oh, yea, son. Who on a mango giveth no cakes for arms? Ask for them who give gifts for poor beggars. Fair lady, if thou wert once shrined in this bosom, I would buckle thee. Father, do you see this man? You little think he'll run a mile or two for such a cake or pass for a pudding? I tell you, Father, he has kept such a begging of me for a piece of this cake. Ooh, he comes upon me with a superstantial substance and the poison of the earth that I know not what he means. If he came to me thus and said, my friend Booby or so, why, I could spare him with a piece with all my heart. But when he tells me how God hath enriched him, uh, me above other fellows with a cake, why, he makes me blind and deaf at once. Yet, Father, here's a piece of cake for you, as hard as the world goes. Uh, thanks, son. Uh, but list to me. He shall be deaf when thou shalt not see. Farewell, my son. Things may so hit. Thou shalt have wealth to mend thy wit. Farewell, Father, farewell. For I must make haste after my two-hand sword that is gone before. Mm, the day is clear, the welkin bright and gay, the lark is merry and records her notes, each thing rejoiceth underneath the sky. Oh, but only I, whom heaven hath in hate, wretched and miserable sacrament, in Thessaly was I born and brought up, my mother Merrowhite. A famous witch, and by her cunning I of her did learn To change and alter shapes of mortal men. Then did I turn myself into a dragon, And stole away the daughter to the king. Fair Delia, mistress of my heart, And brought her hither to revive the man that seemeth young and pleasant to behold, and yet is aged, crooked, weak, and um, thus by enchanting spells I do deceive those that behold and look upon my face, but well may I bid youthful years and you. <gasps> See, where she comes, from whence my sorrows grow. <gasps> How now, Verdelia? Where have you been? Delia, you are muted, my love. Speak to me. Where have you been? Oh, I, I do apologise, my lord. I have been at the foot for the rock for running water and gathering, gathering roots for your dinner, sir. Oh, Delia, fairer art thou than the running water, yet harder far than steel or adamant. Oh, will it please you to sit down, sir? Aye, Delia, sit and ask me what thou wilt. Thou shalt have it brought into thy lap. Oh, well, then I pray you, sir. Let me have the best meat from the King of England's table, and the best wine in all France, brought in by the veriest knave in all Spain. Delia, I am glad to see you so pleasant. Oh, well, uh, sit thee down. <sighs> spread, table spread, meat and drink and bread. Ever may I have what I ever crave when I am spread. <sighs> Meat for my black cock <laughs> and meat for my red. <laughs> oh, here, Delia. <sighs> Will you fall to? Is this the best meat in England? Yea. What is it? Oh, a chin of English beef, meat for a king and a king's followers. Is this the best wine in France? Yea. 
What wine is it? A cup of neat wine of Orléans that never came near the brewers in England. Is this the veriest knave in all Spain? <laughs> Yea. What is he? A friar? Yea, a friar indefinite. And a knave infinite. Then I pray you, Sir Friar, tell me before you go, which is the most greediest Englishman? A miserable and most covetous usurer. Oh, hold me there, Friar. Oh, but soft. Who oh, have we here? Uh, Delia, away! Uh, be gone! Oh, oh, Delia, away! For beset are we! But heaven or hell shall rescue her from me! Oh, Steely. brother, say again. Brother, was not that Delia did appear? Or was it but her shadow that was here? Sister, where art thou? Delia, come again. He calls that of thy absence doth complain. Call out Khalifa that she may hear and cry aloud, for Delia is near. Near. Near? Oh, where hast thou any tidings? Tidings. Which way is Delia then, or, or that, or this? This. And may we safely come where Delia is? Yes. Brother, remember you, the white bear of England's wood. Stop not aside for every danger. Be not afeard of every stranger. Things that seem are not the same. Brother, why do we not then courageously enter? Then, brother, draw thy sword and follow me. Brother, dost thou fall? Aye, and thou too, Caliphate! Oh. And death day, death away with them. Go carry them straight to Sacrepan's spell. There, in despair and torture to dwell. <sighs> These are the noble sons of Thessaly that come to seek Delia, their sister force. But with a potion I to her have given, my arts have made her to forget herself. <laughs> Look, Sacropat removes a turf and shows a light in a glass. See here the thing which doth my life prolong. <laughs> With this enchantment I do anything. Until this fade, my skill shall still endure, and never none shall break this little glass. But she, that's neither wife, widow, nor maid, oh, adjure thyself. This is thy destiny, never to die, but by a dead man's hand. Tell me time, tell me, just time, when shall I Delia see? When shall I see the lodestar of my life? When shall my wandering course end with her sight? Or I but view my hope, my heart's delight? Father, Godspeed, if you tell fortunes, I pray, good father, tell me mine. Oh, son, I do see in thy face thy blessed fortune work apace. I, I do perceive that thou hast wit. Beg of thy fate to govern it, for wisdom governed by advice makes many fortunate and wise. Bestow thy alms, give more than all, till dead men's bones come at thy call. Uh, farewell, my son. Dream of no rest till thou repent that thou didst best. This man hath left me in a labyrinth. He biddeth me give more than all, till dead men's bones come at thy call. He biddeth me to dream of no rest, till
till I repent that I do best. You may be ashamed, you horse and scald, sexton and church warden, if you had any shame in those shameless faces of yours to let a poor man lie so long above ground unburied, to rot on you all. I've no more compassion of a good fellow when he's gone. What? Would you have us to bury him and to answer it ourselves to the parish? Parish me no parishes. Pay me my fees and let the rest run on in the quarter's accounts and put it down for one of your good deeds a God's name. I am not one that curiously stands upon merits. You horse on sodden headed sheep's face. Shall a good fellow do less service and more honesty to the parish? And will you not, when he is dead, let him have his Christmas burial? Peace, Corobus. As sure as Jack was Jack, the frolic of Spranion amongst you, and I, Wigan, his sweet sworn brother, Jack shall have his funerals. Or well, some of them shall lie on God's dear earth for it. That's what's. Wigan. I hope that will do no more than thou darest answer. Sir, sir, dare or dare not, more or less, answer, not answer, do this, have this. Ah! Help! 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 Hold thy hands, good fellow. Can you blame him, sir, if he takes Jack's part against this shake rotten parish that will not bury Jack? Why? What was that, Jack? Who? Jack, sir? Who? Our Jack, sir? As good a fellow as ever trod upon Neat's leather. Look you, sir. He gave fourscore and nineteen morning gowns to the parish when he died. Because they would not make him up a full hundred, they would not bury him. Was this not good dealing? Oh, Lord, sir, how he lies. He was not worth a halfpenny and drunk out every penny. And now his fellows, his drunken companions, would have us to bury him at the charge of the parish. And we make such many matches, we may pull down the steeple, sell the bells, and fetch the chancel. He shall lie above ground till he dance a galliard about the churchyard for Stephen Loach. Ic argumentaris domine Loach. And we make many such matches, we may pull down the steeple, sell the bells, and thoughts the chance. A good time, sir, and hang yourself in the bell ropes when you have done. Domine opponens prepono tibi hamp questionem. Whether you'll have the ground broken or your pates broken first. But one of them shall be done presently. Begin mine, I'll seal it upon your coxcomb. Hold thy hands, I pray thee, good fellow. Be not too hasty. You cape on space. We shall have you turned out of the parish one of these days, with never a tatter to your arse, then you are in worse taking than Jack. Faith, and he is bad enough. His fellow does but the part of a friend to seek to bury his friend. How much will bury him? Faith, about 15 or 16 shillings will bestow him honestly. Aye, even thereabouts, sir. Here, hold it then. And I have left but for me but one, four, three havens. How do I remember the words the old man spake at the cross? Bestow all thou hast, and this is all till dead men's bones come at thy core. Here, hold it, and so farewell. God and all good be with you, sir. Now you, cormorants, I'll bestow one peel of Jack at mine own proper costs and charges. You may thank God the long staff and the Bilbo blade cross not your cocks come. Well, we'll to the church still and have a pot, and so, trillin. Come, let's um, go. Let's go. But hark you, Gammer, methinks this Jack bore a great sway in the parish. Oh, this Jack was a marvellous fellow. He was but a poor man, but very well beloved. You shall see anon what this Jack will come to. Soft, who have we? Our amorous harvesters. Aye, aye, let us sit still and let them alone. Oh, here we come a reaping, a reaping to reap our harvest fruit, and thus we pass the year so long and never be we mute. Lo, oh, here we come a reaping, a reaping to reap our harvest fruit, and thus we pass the year so long and never be we mute. Come on, darling. <laughs> Cheeky. Ah.
soft, who have we here? Oh, this is a choleric gentleman. All you that love your lives keep out of the smell of his two-hand sword. Now goes to the conjurer. He thinks the conjurer should put the fool into the, the juggling box. E fi fum. Here is the, uh, the Welshman. Conquer him that can. Come for his lady bright to prove himself a knight and win her love in fight. Hoo-haw, Master Bango, are you here? Hear you, you had best sit down here and beg in arms with me. And Space Kellyan, here is he that commandeth ingress and egress with his weapon and will enter at his voluntary, whoever saith no. No. So with that, they kissed and spoiled the edge of as good a two-hand sword as God ever put life in, and now goes booby in, in spite of the conjurer. Oh, away with him, into the open fields, to be a ravening prey to crows and kites. Oh. And for this villain, oh, let him wander up and down in naught but darkness and eternal night. Here he had slain. Thou slain Juan, a slashing knight, and robbed poor Booby of his sight. Oh, heads, villain! Heads! Mm. Now I have unto Delia given a potion of forgetfulness, that when she comes, she shall not know her brothers. Oh, lo, where they labour like to the country slaves with spade and mattock on this enchanted ground. Now will I call her by another name, for never shall she know herself again until that sacripant has breathed his last. <gasps> See where she comes. Oh. Come, Delia, take this gold here hard. At hand, two slaves do work and dig for gold. Gore them with this, and thou shalt have enough. Uh, my good sir, I know not what you mean. <laughs> she hath forgotten to be Delia. But not forget the same she should forget, but I will change her name. Oh, fair Bella Cynthia, so this country calls you. Uh, go ply these strangers, wench, for they dig for gold. Oh, heavens, how am I beholding to this fair young man? But I must ply these strangers to their work. See where they come. Brother, see where Delia is. Oh, Delia, happy are we to see thee here. What tell you me of Delia, prating swains? I know no Delia, nor know I what you mean. Ply you your work, or else you're like to smart. Delia, no, it's not thy brothers here. We come from Thessaly to seek thee forth. And thou deceivest thyself. Thou art Delia. Yet more Delia? Then take this and smart. What fain you shifts for to defer your labour? Work, villains, work. It is for gold you dig. Peace, brother, peace. This vile enchanter hath ravished Delia of her senses clean, and she forgets that she is Delia. Leave cruel thou to hurt the miserable. Oh, dig, brother, dig, for she is cruel as hard as steel. See, here they dig and descry a light in a glass under a little hill. Stay, brother, what hast thou described? Give way and touch it not. Wait, tis something that my lord hath hidden there. Well said. Thou pliest these pioneers well. Go get you in, you labouring slaves. Oh. Come, 
there is Cynthia. Let us in likewise and hear the nightingale record her notes. <laughs> Now for a husband, house and home, God sent a good one or none. I pray God, my father hath sent me to the well for the water of life, and tells me, if I give fair words, I shall have a husband. But here comes Salanta, my sweet sister. I'll stand by and hear what she says. Oh, my father has sent me to the well for water, and he tells me, if I speak fair, I shall have a husband, and none of the worst. Well, though I am black, I am sure the world will not forsake me, and as the old proverb is, though I am black, I am not the devil. Mary up with a mooring. I know wherefore thou speakest that, but go thy ways home, as wise as thou camest, or I'll set thee home with the one you. Looky. Here she striketh her pitcher against her sisters, and breaks them both, and goes her way. I think this be the curtest queen in the world. You see what she is? A little fair, but as proud as the devil and the veriest vixen that lives upon God's earth. Well, I'll let her go alone and go home and get another pitcher. And for all this, get me to the well for water. See here, two furies come out of the conjurer's cell and lay on a bango by the well of life. Once again for a husband, and in faith, Salanta, I have got the start of you. Be like husbands go by the well side. Now my father says I must rule my tongue. Why, alas, what am I then? A woman without a tongue is as a soldier without his weapon. But I'll have my water and be gone. Here, as Xantippa offers to dip her pitcher, in comes a head out of the well. Gently deep, but not too deep, for fear you make the golden beard to weep. Fair maiden, white and red, stroke me soothe and comb my head, and thou shalt have some cockle bread. What is this? Fair maiden, white and red, comb me smooth and stroke my head, and thou shalt have some cockle bread? Cockle? Poor scarlet boy, faith, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple bread. See, here she breaks her pitcher upon the head, but Guadabango is deaf and cannot hear. Filida filere dos, pam filida florida flotos. A double da bounce, quote the guns with a sulfurous half sniff. Wicked with a wench, pretty Pete, pretty love, my uh, sweet pretty pigsney, just by thy side uh, shall sit, surnamed Great Wanabango. Safe in my arms will I keep thee, threat Mars or Thunder Olympus. Oh, what greasy groom have we here? He looks as though he crept out of the backside of the well and speaks like a drum perished at the west end. Oh, that I might, <clears throat> but I may not. Woe to my destiny, therefore. Kiss that I clasp, but I cannot. Tell me my destiny, wherefore? Now I have my dream. Did you never hear so great a wonder as this? Three blue beans in a blue bladder. Rattle, bladder, rattle. I'll now set my countenance into her in prose. Maybe this Ram Ramruff is too rude an encounter. <laughs> Let me, fair lady, if you be at leisure, revel with your sweetness and uh, rail upon that cowardly conjurer that had cast me or it congealed me rather into an unkind sleep and polluted my carcass. Laugh, laugh, Santipa. Thou hast thy fortune, a fool and a husband under one. 
absolutely, sweetheart, as I seem, about some twenty years, the very April of my age. Why? What a pretty ass this is. Yeah. Coral lips, uh, crimson chin, uh, silver teeth so white within, golden locks, a rolling eye, uh, your pretty uh, parts, well, let them go by. Um, hey, what they have wounded me. I must die this day to see. And God's bones, thou art a flouting knave, her coral lips, her crimson chin. Ha, uh, true, my own, and, and my own, because mine, and mine, because mine, <laughs> above a thousand pounds in possibility, and things fitting thy desire in uh, possession. For soft things I ask of his lands, Lord be your comfort, and proper be your destiny. Hear you, sir, and if you will have us, you had best say so be time. Oh, true, sweetheart, I will royalize thy progeny with my pedigree. Wretched Eumedes, still unfortunate, envied by fortune and forlorn by fate. Here pine and die, wretched Eumenides, die in the spring, the April of my age. Here, sit thee down, or repent what thou hast done. I would to God that it were ne'er begun. <sighs> you are well overtaken, master. Who's that? Ah, you are heartily well met, sir. Forbear, I say, who is that that pincheth me? Uh, trusting in God, good master Eumenides, that you are in so good health as all your friends were at the making hereof. God give you good morrow, sir. Like you're not a lean, handsome, and cleanly young lad about the age of uh, 15 or 16 years that can run by your horse and, for a need, make your mastership's shoes as black as ink? How say you, sir? Alas, pretty lad, I know not how to keep myself, and much less a servant, my pretty boy. My state is so bad. Content yourself. You shall not be so ill a master, but I'll be as bad a servant. Uh, tut, sir, I know you, though you know not me. Are you not, are not you the man, sir, deny it if you can, sir, that came from a strange place in the land of a uh, Katita, where a jackanapes flies with a tail in his mouth to seek out a lady as white as snow and as red as blood? <laughs> Have I touched you now? I think this boy be a spirit. How knowest thou all this? Tut! Are you not the man, sir, deny it if you can, sir, that gave all the money you had to the burying of a poor man? And but one three halfpence left in your purse. Content, sir, I'll serve you. That is flat. Well, my lad, since thou art so importunate, I'm content to entertain thee, not as a servant, but as a co-partner in my journey. But whither shall we go? For I've not any money more than th the one bare three halfpence. Uh, well, master, content yourself. For if my divination be not out, that shall be spent at the next inn or alehouse we come to. For, master, I know you're passing hungry. Therefore, I'll go before and provide dinner until that you come. No doubt, but you'll come fair and softly after. Aye, go before. I'll follow thee. Oh, but do you hear, master? Do you know my name? No, I promise thee. Not yet. Why? I am Jack. Jack! Why, be it so, then? How say you, sir? Do you please sit down? Hostess, I thank you. I have no great stomach. Pray, sir, what is the reason your master is so strange? Doth not this meat please him? Uh, yes, hostess, but it is my master's fashion to pay before he eats, therefore a reckoning, my good hostess. Mary, shall you, sir, presently? My Jack, what does that mean? Thou knowest I have not any money. Therefore, sweet Jack, tell me what shall I do? Well, master, look in your purse. Why, faith, it's a folly, for I have no money. Why, look you, master, do so much for me. Alas, Jack, my purse is full of money. <laughs> Alas, master, does that word belong to this accident? Why, methinks I should have seen you cast away your cloak and in a bravado dance a galliard round the chamber. 
Why, master, your man can teach you more wit than this. Come, hostess, cheer up, my master. You are heartily welcome, and if it pleases you to eat of a fat capon, a fairer bird, a finer bird, a sweeter bird, a crisper bird, a neater bird, your worship never eat of. Thanks, my fine, eloquent hostess. Ah, uh, but hear you, master, one word by the way. Are you content I shall be halves in all you get in your journey? I am, Jack. Here is my hand. <laughs> Enough, master. I ask no more. Come, hostess, receive your money, and I thank you for my good entertainment. You are heartily welcome, sir. Come, Jack. Whither we go we now? A merry master to the conjurers, presently. Content, Jack. Hostess, farewell. Oh, come, my duck, come. I have now got a wife. Thou art fair, art thou not? My Caribus, the fairest alive, make no doubt of that. Come, wench, are we almost at the well? Aye, Caribus, we are almost at the well now. I'll go fetch some water. Sit down while I dip my pitcher in. Look, a head comes up with ears of corn as she combs them into her lap. Gently dip, but not too deep, for fear you make the golden beard to weep. Fair maiden, white and red, comb me smooth and stroke my head, and thou shalt have some cockle bread. Yeah. And see here? A second head comes up full of gold, which she combs into her lap. Gently dip, but not too deep, for fear thou make the golden beard to weep. Fair maid, white and red, comb me smooth and stroke my head, and every hair a sheaf shall be, and every sheaf a golden tree. Oh, Kareva, see, I have combed a great deal of gold into my lap, and a great deal of corn. Well said, wench. Now we shall have just enough. God, send us coiners to coin our gold. But well, come, shall we go home, sweetheart? Nay, come, Coribus, I will lead you. So, Coribus, things have well hit. Thou hast gotten wealth to win thy wit. Come away, master. Come away, master, come. Go along, Jack. Follow thee. Jack, they say it is good to go cross-legged and say prayers backward. How sayest thou? Ah, oh, Tut, never fear, master, let me alone. Here, sit you still, speak not a word, because you shall not be enticed with his enchanting speeches. With this same wool, I'll stop your ears. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And so, master, sit still, for I must do the conjurer. Oh, how now? What man art thou that sits so sad? Why dost thou gaze upon these stately trees without the leave and will of sacrament? What? <sighs> Not a word but mum. Oh, then sacrament, thou art betrayed. See, here the ghost of Jack invisible takes sacrament's wreath from his head <gasps> and the sword from his hand. <gasps> And invades the head of sacrapants. What hateful fury doth envy my happy state? Then, sacrapant, these are thy last days. Oh, alas, my veins are numb, my sinews shrink, oh, my blood is pierced, my breathing breath away, and, and, and now. My timeless date is come to end. Oh, he in whose life his acts have been so foul. Now, in his death to hell, descends his soul. Oh, sir, are you gone? Ah, now I hope we shall have some other coil. 
Now, master, how like you this? The conjurer, he is dead and vows to never trouble us more. Now, get you to your fair lady and see what you can do with her. Ah, alas, he heareth me not all this while, but I will help that. How now, Jack? What news? <laughs> Here, master, take this sword and dig with it at the foot of this hill. How now, Jack? What is this? <laughs> Master, without this, the conjurer could do nothing. So long as this light lasts, so doth his art endure. And this being out, then doth his art decay. Why then, Jack, I will soon put out this light. Aye, Master, how? Why, with a stone I'll break the glass, and then blow it out. <laughs> no, Master, you may as soon break the smith's anvil as this little vial nor the biggest blast that ever Boreas blew cannot blow out this little light. But she that is neither maid, wife, nor widow. Ha. Master, wind this horn and, and see what happens. See, it's Vanilla who breaks the glass and blows out the light. So, Master, how like you this? This is she that ran madding in the woods, his betrothed love that keeps the cross, and now, the light being out, all are restored to their former liberty. Uh, yeah, that guy. Um, and now, master, to the lady you have so long looked for. Godspeed, fair maid, sitting alone. There is once. Godspeed, fair maid. There is twice. Godspeed, fair maid. That is thrice. Mm, not go so good, sir, for you are by. Enough, master. She hath spoke. Now I will leave her. Thou fairest flower of these western parts, whose beauty so reflecteth in my sight, as doth a crystal mirror in the sun. For thy sweet sake I have crossed the frozen Rhine, leaving fair Po. I sailed up Danube, as far as Saba, whose enchanting streams cut twixt the Tartars and the Russians. These have I crossed to thee, fair Delia. Then grant me that which I have sued so for long. Thou gentle knight, whose fortune is so good to find me out and set my brothers free. My faith, my heart, my hand I give to thee. Thanks, gentle madam. But here comes Jack. Thank him, for he is the best friend that we have. Now, now, Jack, what hast thou there? Marry, sir, the head of the conjurer. Why, Jack, that is impossible. He was a young man. Ah, master, so he deceived them that beheld him. But he was a miserable, old, and crooked man, though to each man's eye he seemed young and fresh. For, master, this conjurer took the shape of the old man that kept the cross, and that old man was in the likeness of the conjurer. Ah, but now, master, wind your horn. Welcome, Arrestus. Welcome, fair Vanalia. Welcome, Thelia Ooh. and Cliffa both. Now I heard that I so long had sought, so saith fair Delia, if we have your consent, My apologies. Humanities. Thou well deservest to have our favour, so let us rejoice that by thy means we are at liberty. Here may we joy in each other's sight, and this fair lady have a wandering night. So, Master, now you think you have done, but I must have a saying to you. You know you and I were partners, I to have half in all you got. Why, so thou shalt, Jack. Why then, master, draw your sword, part your lady, let me have half of her presently. Why, I hope, Jack, thou dost with jest. I promised thee half I got, but not half my lady. Uh, but, but what else, master? Have you not gotten her? Therefore divide her straight, for there is no remedy. Well, there I will falsify my word unto my friend. Take her all. Here, Jack. I'll give her thee. A nay, neither more nor less, master, but even just half. Before I will falsify my faith unto my friend, I will divide her. 
Jack, thou shalt have far. You be not so cruel unto our sister, gentle knight. Oh, spare fair dear, yeah, she deserves no death. Content yourselves, my word is past to him. Therefore prepare thyself, Delia, for thou must die. Then farewell, well, adieu, Eumenides. Stay, master. It is sufficient I have tried your constancy. Do you remember now, since you paid for the burying of a poor fellow? Aye, very well, Jack. And then, master, thank that good deed for this good turn. And so, God be with you all. Jack, what art thou gone? Then farewell, Jack. Come, brothers, and my beauteous Delia, Orestes, and my dear Vanalia, we will to Thessaly with joyful hearts. Three. 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 What? Gamer asleep? Why the mess, son? Tis almost day, and my window's shut at cockcrow. Do you hear, Gamma? Methinks this Jack bore a great sway amongst them. Oh, man, this was the ghost of the poor man that they kept such a coil to bury, and that makes him to help the wandering knight so much. But come, let us in. We will have a cup of ale and a toast this morning, and so depart. Then you've made an, an end of your tale, Gamma? Yes, faith. When this is done, I took a piece of cheese, bread and cheese and came my way. And so you shall have two before you go to your breakfast. And they all lived happily ever after. Uh, and yes, curtain call from everyone. There we go. There we go. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that was, um, uh, the, uh, the old wife's tale, um, which went at a, a, a fair old licks ever so slightly over an hour. Um, a lot of physical business that we can't really do, a lot of stuff that we can't really get put proper weight to, but giving uh, a general shape of things. Um, I mean, there's no point to anyone uh, 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 pointing out that you may be a bit confused about what's going on in the plot because I don't think it matters. I, th I think, you know, the play is clearly trying to confuse us at points. Um, though there may be points where uh, resolutions are, are curtailed for various reasons. Um, so, uh, who wants to leap in with, with some, uh, some general thoughts about the, uh, the, the overall shape of the play and how it, how it functions? Um, or your characters, yeah, who, which, which of your individual characters? Sarah, you enjoyed being Sacropant. Um, I think it's fair to say, you uh, died you well. Tell? <laughs> yeah, I loved being Sacropant. I, I wasn't here for the original um, uh, uh, reading of this, so I, I watched it and really enjoyed it and then read it through. And, and like the more I read it, the more I thought, oh, he's fun. And I mean, I did, I did make a bit of a, possibly a, a naughty choice because I mean most of the play he's meant to be in the um, you know he's meant to look like a handsome dashing young man um, and so theoretically I suppose I should have played him that way but I I just really wanted to play him as the lecherous old wizard so that's what I did. Internally, that's who he was. You know, we can yeah. we can project the avatar over you later. Exactly. Um, you know. That was showing the inner the inner life. There. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just think of this as uh, you know, we'll 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 do the digital work, and you know, it'll yeah. all be fine. It'll all be fine. Um, yeah, we, we you know we're introduced, of course, to the ghost of Jack. How 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 was how was the ghost of Jack uh, in comparison with your other parts? I think. Um, Oh, The Ghost of Jack was uh, great fun. Yes, I really could have used that book uh, as, a, as a guide. Um, uh, I mean, I think we'll, we'll all need that book eventually, uh, won't true. we? It's true. Um, the, uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I didn't want to play him sinister. I think it's more sinister if you just play him as wholesome as possible. And then he bounces up and asks someone to chop his wife in half. Um, you know... He's already a ghost. I think you, uh, you know, if I'd tried to be Casper the friendly ghost here, I, I think it would have backfired. But, um, but, but I, I like, I, I really like Jack. You know, he's, he's the reason this play is only an hour long instead of three. He's, he speeds the plot. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's a plot device. He's a plot device. Um, and yeah, and it's that thing of you know we you know with the 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 physicality of it being produced as well. To you know there are lots of signifiers we can get to make it clearer that he is a ghost from you know uh, a certain point. And you know they do bury him. You know, or in theory they bury him. They have a large argument about burying Jack, and uh, it's a matter of in production you need to really sort of connect that together but then also you were a bear uh very noticeably um nice. i mean it was a seamless transformation between yeah. human and bear yeah there's um, nothing we could nothing we can't achieve with this modern technology that we're using <laughs> well I, I i was interested with your choice of actually literally becoming the bear um which you know that i don't think the text pushes for but that's a really interesting thought because it would be another white bear uh that we've encountered in so many weeks I, I wondered if someone had uh, the hide of some poor little polar bear or possibly a sheepskin thing faked up to look like the hide of a polar bear. Uh, either is possible. Mm. Well, you know, I could see this being done in rep with uh, with Musidorus, even though it's not a play that is actually associated with the same company. But it's 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 just uh, the 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 co coincidence of, of, of white bears just interests me. Um, and I would have thought he would have some fur trimming or something as part of his costume, even if he doesn't go full bear. Yeah, I, I like the idea of him having some kind of raggedy, white, fuzzy blanket. Again, you could perfectly well use sheepskin for that. Um, and just maybe add some bear claws or something. Polar bear onesie. Um... <laughs> well, I, I swear, if I if I ever do direct this, um, it's going to be two furries instead of two furies. <laughs> <laughs> that would just be too horrific. That would just and, be too horrific. And Sacrapant is going to be really angry about it. <laughs> um, and we had a Welsh, uh, Wales, Welsh uh, uh, um, uh, which, so um, funny. Uh, that which seemed to work. Seemed to work. Um, but it, it's difficult to, you, you know, being a thesp is the obvious sort of choice to make, really, because of all the rhetoric. Um, but I tried I tried to do it. I don't have the vocal technique to do proper full-on thesp, you see. So, um, But doing the accent seemed to sort of help. So that's why I did it that way. That's so good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and then we have, I mean, the question is, in, in the way we've done it, mostly the the uh, the outside story or the storyteller, as it were, and the storytelling, uh, you know, the people watching the story in this doubling have remained outside the action, and it uh, it, it seems a shame that they they uh, they're not stepping in and playing parts, um, mm. but that doesn't necessarily seem to be how it how it works. I mean, uh, how did you find Madge, uh, Lynn? Oh, I love her. I I, I she's just like so dotty and. <laughs> You can kind of tell that this really fractured tell, tale kind of came out of her head. You know, you've got the two daughters thread and then the Delia thread. It's like, how do those even... Yeah, it's like, who came up with this before maybe it, before lab produced hallucinogens? How did you... <laughs> Cheese. Ergot. Yeah. Ergot of rye. It's, it's yeah. the magic mushrooms again. Yeah. Yeah. And then she's like nodding off during her own tale at the end. I, I mean, I think she's kind of hilarious. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, uh, you know, there's the question of what her reactions are as she's going along, is it, you know, because she's clearly forgetting her own story and then remembering bits and that, and that sort of explains the dramaturgy. It's, it's all <laughs> chopping and changing as, oh, oh, there's this bit. Sorry, we'll just do it now. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, um, the harvest men are in fact, uh, her deep, dark sexual fantasies that just keep uh, yeah. intruding Harry on the story. Not me personally, but as they would be done. Um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I see really, them as basically, basically, you know, Chip not wearing any shirts, um, <laughs> just, just walking on, just being terribly hunky. Um, <laughs> thunder down on their legs there. Mm. Oh, maybe, maybe that, that, that doesn't. That that's a cultural weapon. The Thunder Down Under is a is a male burlesque show in Las Vegas, which is a big gambling town here in in the states. So they're and they're from Australia. So uh. punky, punky Australians in g-strings is what the Thunder Down Under is. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> The bear's getting excited. Um, um, I felt kind of bad that I didn't have the dragon to hand because it's on the uh, like on 
the other table and um yeah sort of t enact the sort of uh, you know kidnapping of this daughter of the king mm. Mm. but um, it feels like you could do this whole thing as a sort of pop well not puppet show but like sort of diorama type thing it, it, it yeah. offers so many options in terms of storytelling techniques you know I'm, I'm, yes when Madge is first telling the story you want to get the cloth out and do shadow puppets don't you um, yeah. and, while, and then they come through the, the sheet and suddenly the characters are literally there or something like that yeah. I mean it's the exit of Clunge and um, and, um, and Antic um, <laughs> for reasons of doubling basically uh, but it's, uh, it's just, yeah, but just, also... the, <laughs> just the way Clunge just drags him off <laughs> Come with me, little boy. Um... <laughs> I was not dodgy at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, but they could be, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there's, yes, you've got all the possibilities what, what to throw at this and, and what the aesthetic is. And... and and I looked up those two words that, that she said, the, the wind gall and baby or whatever. Yeah, and they're uh, they're ailments of horses uh, that that create like lumps or bumps or deformities on the horse's body. So mm -hmm. her husband's a horse. Take from that what you will. Everyone's a furry in this play. That's my new theory. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I like is that you've got like the sort of facts. You've got like sort of basically the excuse for the story, which is kind of like um, you know fantastic for all like an antic following their master because you know I'm, I'm guessing in the middle of the woods and they're lost and somehow they find a hut and it's like okay so like what, what about that story <laughs> like what happened to the other guy <laughs> yeah there, there's there's this backstory that they mention of their master getting married and therefore they being turned off as superfluous to the new household um and you never really find out more about that it's a MacGuffin. Unless uh, it's one of the couples from the story and the whole thing is just ooh, like, ooh, yeah. turning it on itself. <laughs> oh, maybe Antic and Frolic and Fantastic will get jobs with um, Eumenides and, and, uh, and, and Delia or something. Never know. Or, or, the, or Juan Ebango and Zentipa or... Yeah, because we have all these these sort of generic pairings and generic actions, and it's you know the question of how much life and agency these you know uh, you, you want to be playing with, whether these characters know their characters and how much they know, and mm. um, you know there's all sorts of games that could be had with this, as well as interpolating occasional uh, random bits of business. Uh, I mean, the, the, there's presumably a doubling reason why we don't get more, a sort of resolution with more of the characters on stage at the end. Um, and uh, you know the the various pairings of the blind and the deaf and etc. Um, it's sort of, I mean, it's sort of wrapped up, but it's sort of not. And I'm assuming that's just for doubling reasons. Even with the doubling, it just there's there's a load of characters. I I think you'd need a, a lot of bodies. Have you crunched that? Uh, well, this the, we are using um, a, uh, a putative doubling scheme uh, for the, that might have been used um, for for the original uh, company. Uh, apart from me, I don't count. Um, but, so um, but that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, one of the the n number crunching of getting it down to ten for two of the more fantastical stories. So for this and um, uh, Climon and uh, Climides, uh, doubled down to ten in, in a relatively but, efficient fashion. What I thought was, it seems kind of intuitive that maybe Sacrepent would double Arrestus since they're said to have exchanged forms. Mm. Uh, I, 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 that, that I wasn't sure on uh, myself, I have to say. Um, that, but then maybe, yeah, maybe we're I thinking too logically. To <laughs> <laughs> I think so long as the head looks like him, that's the thing that matters um because it's not a there's never a literal on stage thing so they i think they can look different um so so long as the the, the head you bring on at the end um makes sense that head by the way <laughs> oh that was so funny whoa man you know i spent a week trying to figure out what the best head i could find was oh, and um, that was classic because the thing is they're always talking about stroking the head and then things <laughs> coming out of it and it's a cockle uh, cock 
cockle bread. Uh, so I wanted to try and find something that was moderately phallic, um, and that, that was as good as I got. It does actually have holes in it, because this is actually a sieve. Oh. Um, so um, I could have gone. Neat. It could have gone really dodgy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I very nearly corpsed. <laughs> I'll be honest during that section. <laughs> um. Right. Yeah. So um, I you know it's 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 not quite um, you know it, it, yeah the the opening of the play could start us of us off into a horror film really couldn't it um you know they're, they're wandering through the woods and they encounter mm. this strange man walking. Who's wandering along with his dog? Um, <laughs> there's a dog. Evidently, there's an actual dog. It seems like there's an actual dog on stage. Well, I don't know. It says um, it, it's just a dog bark. So I think it could be off. I think it's just someone in the ring just going. Woof, woof. <laughs> um, I like the idea that like one of them just suddenly just gets like their leg sort of bitten by the dog and they're like just struggling and it's like let go let go <laughs> but like There's sort of so much upstaging yeah. business uh potential of which talking yes. about upstaging Sarah, sarah's violin playing was was uh was a, a joy for the viewers at home i did inform ask everyone to if they had a part that didn't say anything that they had to really go for it physically if the, if they uh, were so inclined and sarah was so inclined with her fiddle playing and that was what it was a very small fiddle <laughs> It's a very yes. <laughs> Size <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't have a violin prop, and then I was like, oh, wait, yes, I do. <laughs> the joy of Zoom. It's actually full size. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, general thoughts from the room um, about this one. I mean, it's 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 it, it is really fun, um, but there is a certain amount of going at a full tilt there is a certain amount of catching up time that seems to need to happen it took me a while to get into this actually and mm -hmm. click into it uh and that seems to be an important that's quite important for a play that moves so damn quickly uh if you lose your audience quickly that you know if you don't get them on board then you are a bit screwed however funny that you manage to make it and i don't think we should avoid any of the jokes you know let's let's land on every single joke um i mean i could for example with the echo um you know you could vaguely make the yes rhyme with is you could sort of make that work but i think it's just funnier if it's just deadpan yeah just like no you've given me nothing guys to work with <laughs> um so yeah uh sarah yeah, uh, what you were saying about, you know, uh, it taking a while to, to get into it. Um, I, I, when I watched the, um, the recording of the original read through, a, a lot of people were talking about pantomime. Mm. And I think if you, if you frame that opening with antic and, and frolic and fantastic as if you make it as fairy tale as possible, because I mean, it is, isn't it? They're lost in the woods. They, they meet a stranger, they end up at a hut, there's an old witchy figure telling a story. I mean, it is just, it's, it's a delicious beginning to a fairy tale. So I guess if you really played up the fairy tale aspect of that, that would be a good way in. You draw the audience in and then they'd be, um, you, know, you know, I mean, if you were doing this live, obviously, that's, yeah, mm. would be the way to do it. Um, uh, Eric? I like how so at the beginning, somehow fantastic is the logical one, sort of like, you know, it's logical that, we're, I mean, you know, we've been following this guy for like a few, however long we've been following him. And it's logical that we're lost in the woods, you know, uh, kind of, why do you think it's strange? <laughs> he's been, he's like run, run off to sort of mar marry um, that, the woman of his life, or uh, love of his life or something. And they're just left there. <laughs> mm. Um, so we also have Booby the clown, um, and uh, uh, so uh, Dan, Dan, how are you finding the 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 clowning antics of if he is a clown, for that matter? I, I, I don't know. He's sort of straight man to to funny clown uh, is perhaps his better way of describing him. Yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed Booby and Corbus. It was I, at one point I was a little lost with um, what ha if they really are the same character there because of the fact that Booby is blinded at one point and then all of a sudden he appears again and no problem at all there. So I wondered if those are actually meant to be two separate characters there. Uh, no, wasn't he 
wasn't he blinded in that scene? I think he's supposed to be blinded in that scene. Yeah, yeah. he was blinded, right. But then he comes back later on and there's no, no mention, uh, no, no issues with it. But, in, but when he comes back later on, he's Corvus. So, but I was reading them both as if it was the same character. So it just seemed like something that was not resolved. Uh, no, when he returns... I think he... it is the same character. Yeah, it's just, um... Booby is just a descriptor. Right. I, I, I agree. Just, just that, though. It just seemed odd that it was just never addressed again. Um... That, I mean, obviously it didn't have to be permanent blindness, just something that... When, when, Cor when, uh, when Booby returns, he's still blind. Is he? Okay. Yeah. Because uh, he says, um, uh, are we almost at the well? He's asking oh, where Yeah, are. yeah, I, I totally just missed that. I mean, I was just kind of thinking as in he doesn't know where the well is. Yeah, because there's, okay. there's a Coribus who is, the, um, who is at the burial and has, is, 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 is doing a, you know, is, uh, is having the argument with all the other people. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a separate character, if that makes sense. They may still have the same name. Right. Um, but uh, presumably the basic confusion is they're played by the same actor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that, that, that was just the one thing that confused me a little bit there, mm. was I would have expected some kind of continuity, but apparently there wasn't. I just missed it there. Sarah, are you doing the low budget version of like <laughs> the polar bear? I just, I, I just, I just sent my, my hub a, a message saying, do you happen to have your polar bear hat handy? And he brought it to me. So mm. like, if Liza, if oh only, my God! I could have sent it to you through the post. That is the... That is the best uh, thing. Well, you know, my mind is running to if if I if I if one were to somehow make a full online production of this happen, because I think a lot of the SFX would be easier to do online than in real life. Yeah, very um, easy. <laughs> rawr, rawr, rawr. It's, it's, it's just uh, going back to the uh, the 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 booby um, uh, scene. You know, when he's blind. Uh, the I mean the thing is there's there's basically this this giant head which is being stroked by your 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 mm -hmm. intended in an incredibly sexual way um, and you can't see it so uh, the, the 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 gag is quite rude actually it's this this actually it may look like it's a nice children's thing but actually if you go for it it's quite filthy in places because <laughs> we literally do have a shooting head um, so. <laughs> It's true, actually. Uh, if, uh, if, if we go all out. Um, yeah, and the things that come out of it are grain, seed, yeah. and gold. Yeah. yeah, so you've got the blind man like just... Uh, butter brain. Is that me? Is that... No, it's not you. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> the blind oh. man's sitting there while she's uh, doing, doing things. Doing, yeah. Yeah. And she brushes them into her lap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Raining is treasures on earth. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna just just pull us back now. Let's let's let's. Well, she's <laughs> that was your fault. <laughs> I I thought it was important to explain why Booby was 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 blind during that scene. It's very important. Important plot point. I say plot point. It's not. A, there is no plot. <laughs> Stuff happens. <laughs> Either no plot or too much plot. Yeah. Uh, um. It's all about conventions and stuff sort of happening. Um, so yeah, we're um, we're yeah. I, I I don't know if we're going to go round the room. Do we? Uh, whether we feel that uh, sort of just general final thoughts about uh, this session and uh, and the play. Um, I think most of you weren't here for the first uh, read through. So in a sense, it's been I also was. a bit of, a bit of a first I read through. Thing. Yeah. I was. I was. Um, so uh, a reasonable. Uh, 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 there is some. Uh, continued knowledge um but um you know with a little more prep and, and playing around uh alan final thoughts yeah it's been enjoyable it certainly moves a fair crack um i mean it's it reminds me very much many years ago um there's a party and there was a the daughters of some friends of ours came along and about eight o'clock this last was was sort of put in into the bedroom and she found all of um, my ex's cuddly toys and had them lined up along, along the wall and was telling them the most complicated bedtime story you ever heard, made up of every fairy tale you'd ever heard in your life, all mishmashed together. And it reminded me incredibly of this. 
um, you know, because you've got the three bears, but you then also got Jack and the Beanstalk throughout coming in as a random appearance. You know, it was sort of compendium of every fairy story ever heard. Mm. Uh, Stephen, final thoughts? Um, well, uh, does anybody know Noises Off by Michael Frame? <laughs> yep. Yes. Uh, the, the plates mm. of sardines. There's lots of plates of sardines in this play. Noises Off is a, is a play, it's a farce uh, about putting a play on and they have terrible trouble with the prop, basically, the plate of sardines. And um, I think there's, that, that seems really kind of, the thing I got from doing it all, all straight through was just how hot you'd have to be as a stage manager to get all of that sorted you know we have this very free and easy idea of um of the theater of the time i think which is it's quite loose and it's certainly i'm i'm struggling to think of another play which has got so much business and so many things with props in such a, a short time and i wondered then about the length of the play because if it's an hour long then you've got more time to sort all that stuff out, haven't you? But you don't necessarily need to, um, the time you would have spent elsewise is now freed up because it's such a short play. And I was just, just wondering about that and the ecology of the, the London theatre, if you like, that there might've been shorter pieces, but people might've felt they got their money's worth because there was more business and they could rehearse the business properly as opposed to do that kind of, you know, we think of these theatre people as kind of winging it. Mm. So that's my thought. Well, was, uh, to follow on from that thought, I mean, I've been thinking about uh, just the nature of the Queen's Men as, as a company that spends most of its time not really in London playhouses, but on tour. Uh, and the, the, their repertoire could, could actually be much, much smaller uh, than, uh, than other companies. So that they've got more of an opportunity for doing this play again and again. Um, so a complicated play like this is is much more plausible for them than for another company where, um, you know, it might be two weeks before you do it again. But if you're on tour and you go to a town and you're only you might get two, three performances in that town um, and before you move on to the next one, um, you, you, you might have a much smaller repertoire. So I was, that that thought was coming in there as well. Um, and uh, uh, as well as, um, you know, whether there, there, there is a, a second piece that goes with this, perhaps. That's an option as well. But uh, yeah, I like the idea that because it's just so tight that, you know, it's just naturally got down to that length um, um, because, you know, you've got the time uh, and the inclination to do it that way. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, any final thoughts from you? I really enjoyed the play. I thought that the pace was really quick. We read it, in, oh, I think we read it quite quickly, but I think the pace of the play was really, really fast. And that, that was a good thing, because I think it helps the audience to stay engaged and stay focused on the narrative and the characters. I think the characters were really well drawn and really very well performed. Um, I mean, my favourite character has got to be um, uh, an imaginary Mary Greek. Oh, my favourite character. I can't remember their name. Uh, the one we have married me from yesterday. Um, I think it was the one that was the love interest. No, no, Delia. Delia. So Delia was my favourite character. And I really like the Hell in the Well. It was really good. And lots of, there's lots of vignettes in the, in the play that makes you remember, remember it. So, for example, the head in the well. Yeah, so good, so good. You're going to reuse that, that that at least twice in the show. Um, um, absolutely. Um, uh, Liza, final thoughts. Well, um, you know, I have an unreasonable love for this play in all its WTF glory, um, and. Uh, yeah, verbally, it's so economic. It gets the maximum done with the least amount of words. There's nothing extra. There's no posturing. Um, I like Steve's point about this is a tech-intensive play. 
and touring it is going to be immensely harder than doing it at, at you know in your home theater where you can stash everything um i think that because the text is so short things like the musical interludes with the harvest men and all will be a little more drawn out and also there will be some visual sequences involving probably music and physical performance i think vanilia is probably a dancer I think, um, you know, or, or just physical performer. Um, and the, you know, things like combing the gold out of the heads is going to take a little bit longer and have some music and be more of a set piece. Uh, so that too would take uh, a little more rehearsal, wouldn't you say? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, this guy enjoyed uh, his moment on stage, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's been it's been a long week, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, uh, Sasha, final thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was one of the ones who read it the first time round um, before, and obviously different roles. But uh, yes, again, I loved it the second time round. Um, I will say the um, the doubling of Delia and Calenta was very very quick at one point um so if you were to stage this then yeah whoever plays these two roles be prepared quick change <laughs> very quick change to um differentiate the characters so uh, that was just a little bit of a note on a practical scale there but just generally i forgot how much of a wet limp Delia is. It's like, yeah, typical fairy tale princess. It's like, oh yes, my lord, of course, my lord, and uh, and then and then you got the you then you got Kalenta, who's just, well, she is Kalenta, <laughs> really. She's uh, she wants she wants her goods. She's got them, and um, put it this way, even with that gag, it's clear she'll do anything to get what she wants, even if it means. Um, hoodwinking the so-called love of her life um so it was fun playing those two different extremes for me and uh yeah on a practical level whether you do it zoom or, or on stage i think it's very workable very fun very doable more please yeah i mean the advantage of modern company has is uh, we don't have to um be con so constrained with uh, uh female and male doubling standards of, of of then so you know here the the female parts are all very clustered uh for uh, presumably for boy players uh we don't have to do that and wouldn't so in fact the combinations we might do for a production might be quite different to this uh mm -hmm. this is this is just uh a, a suggested uh selection dan final thoughts yeah it was a fun play it wasn't i can't say i really absolutely loved it i felt like it was just something that it was a nice diversion I enjoyed, I enjoyed reading it. Um, I enjoyed the fact that this was yet another Queen's Men's play that I wasn't there for the first time, but now I get to learn. Um, I am interested in the fact that it has some connections with Orlando Furioso. I mean, not just the name Sacropan, but there's actually a couple of repeated lines, um, specifically, um, well, one of them being the three blue beans in a blue um, bladder. Um, I forgot who had read that um, during our workshop there, but mm. it just there's echoes of that there. So just something that I'd want to explore personally is um, if what other connections there are and just, I don't know, just dive into that history a bit, little bit more. Mm, yes, we had, uh, we also had a, was there a very similar listing of food uh, when we did uh, Famous Victories last week as well. So I'm just wondering if lists of food is a, is a Queen's Men trope. Um, but then again, it might just be, I, I haven't checked, so that could be a massive overreach. Uh, Eric, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I wasn't here for the first reading. I, I enjoyed it and I feel like it's one of those things that can be very, very small or very, very big depending on how much you want to spend on it and how much time you want to spend. Um, as we've talked about, like sort of you can either stage it fully or you can sort of, um, you know, even animate it if you want. <laughs> I mean, you know, it would be a perfect like, YouTube animation to spend for an hour or something. Um, but I also felt like there were a lot of characters, like as someone who is watching it while watching it or while being in it, sort of, you know, which is kind of weird. Uh, it was kind of like, well, so who's this guy and who's that guy? And that was a genuine sort of like 
what is going on here? <laughs> like, there there are so many characters like that aren't properly. They don't do the whole. Uh, as Liza said, they don't do the whole posturing of like, "Hi, I'm Arrestus, and I am uh, in love with so and so." And that one. I mean, they have very short introductions. But I liked it over. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point about you know. Yes, we could spend a lot of money and make this very grand, or it could be very simple, poor uh, theatre. You know, yes, there are a few sort of uh, props and settings and things, but you could reduce this down to something very, very simple, because it's storytelling. Um, so you you can go either way. Um, it's a lot of fun to be had there. Lynn, final thoughts. Well, yes, I um, uh, I have sort of a soft spot for. Uh, for meta theater, for storytelling about storytelling, uh, it's just, that's that's just something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. So I definitely think it's it's doable. It's worth doing. It's you know it's worth thinking about. Um, actually, not just fantasizing about, but but producing. And there's two hard things. The first one that you know Stephen touched on, and other people reiterated that logistically. Uh, there's a lot going on. So that would take some thinking and some rehearsal. And the other thing is, 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 is squishier. The, the first, I actually listened to the exploring sessions of, of this uh, because somebody mentioned that it was reminiscent of the, the, the two C's that we did. Um, so I'm like, I was curious about it. And I was, you know, I struggled in the beginning of those exploring sessions to try to make sense of it all. And I think you, as a producer director, you have to find a way to um, get your audience to give up on that impulse to make sense of it. I, I, that, that you just kind of have to let it wash over you uh, and trying to actually make it make sense is working against the, the mission of the text. So how do you get your audience not to do that, to engage in the right way? So that's something to think about. Mm, yes, um, excellent thoughts. Uh, Sarah, final thoughts? Or Bear, I don't know. Um, who, who am I talking to? You're a totally different person to me now. Oh. <laughs> um, I pretty much agree with uh, everything that most people are saying. Uh, Liza especially, like her, I have an unreasonable love of this play. Um, I wasn't in the original um, read-through, but I just love it. I love the fact that it's so concise um gets to where it's going lots of really really good jokes um lots of physicality lots of room for, for sort of song and dance um yeah i i i think i think it should be on stage i really do um I, it's the thing about um this having needing a, a really good stage manager is when stephen said that i immediately thought of noel coward actually because his plays the, the stage managers always lose about a stone or however many kilos that is it, well, during a, an old cow run because there's always so many props mm -hmm. and you do need someone to um, choreograph it. But um, it, it, I, that's doable. I mean, would need a lot of rehearsing, but that is the point of rehearsal. So I think we could produce something very fun and slick and funny and magical that a, a modern audience would really enjoy. Mm. Um, Francis, final thoughts? Yeah, um, I wasn't in the uh, original session and I wish I had been and I wish I um, prepared better for this. Um, uh, I loved uh, the series performance as uh, Sacrapant and Stephen's performance as uh, Winner Baker or whatever his name was. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, like Daniel, I I didn't love it, uh, but I enjoyed the the reading, and um, I quite like to read it again because I, you know, uh, I, I agree with what people are saying. You know that uh, you, you have to get a modern audience on board because it is very difficult to follow. Um, it, it, it also had the feel to me of a um, of a pantomime, something that you do just before Christmas, kind of wrap the to wrap the season up, as it were. Um, and following on from a point that Alan made, it kind of reminded me a bit of um, Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods because that uh, that's uh, 
<clears throat> that's a mashup of uh, various fairy tales. Not his best show, I hasten to add. Um, oh. Anything else? Um, <laughs> Controversial. No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, reached the end of our uh, our time. Um, uh, Eric's put a nice uh, thing in the. Uh, Eric, uh, you put something in the chat. Uh, just just state that out loud. That's quite a good point. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it was. It reminded me. I was going to say it, but I forgot it. So um, it reminded me of like seventies and eighties B movies, like sort of like really crap, cheaply produced stuff. That but like that is still enjoyable, <laughs> and. Um, yeah. Also, I think you should wear your hair like this every week. Well, you know, I, oh, yes. I, I, it's, it's, we, we, we can vote on that. Um, I vote so... yes. <laughs> yeah, suit you, uh, sir. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, that was uh, The Old Wives' Tale. That was our second look. Um, and uh, it was, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, just as much fun the second time as the first time. There's an awful lot to be done with it to make it make it sing to get it clearer to get uh, get more gags out of it um and we're always on the hunt for more gags uh, if you have any thoughts about uh, what to do with this play if you have uh, uh, if you'd like to help make it uh, come about you can become a patron um we have a patron page where uh, we uh, try to gather money to actually put on productions and in theory we are supposed to be doing an audio version uh, of this play it was uh, scheduled to be happening this year it's not happening this year because of plague. Um, but it's still very much down in the forefront of uh, productions we want to get on its feet. Uh, in uh, my mind, it was very much going to be a live show, but a live audio recording show. So it was going to involve a lot of Foley um, and, mm. uh, and a, a ridiculous uh, sort of visual sense that uh, also doesn't actually matter for the, the audio side of things. And uh, we were definitely going to give Vanalia actually some words because uh, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Liza on the uh, the idea that she's it could be a dancer. She, I mean, literally, it could be an acrobat or something. Uh, Queen's men were associated with uh, with acrobats and things over time, so uh, the idea of having someone who's uh, entirely doing physical theatre um, uh, sort of fits quite well. Uh, but all that remains there at this stage is to say thank you very much to all the readers today and farewell. Bye. <laughs>